metal is so renowned? Well, it, that's hard to describe. <laughs> uh, for a long time, there were many, many poor metals out there. Uh, rather terrible, actually. But it was the best they had. And metallurgy, per se, wasn't understood. It was more rote repetition. You'd see something that worked, and you'd repeat it without knowing why. The, the interesting thing about Wootz is that it formed these, these hard carbides, these tiny white specks that you see in the blade. Open up any catalog that has a Wootz specimen in it, and you'll see this pattern. And it was talked about poetically again, like ant tracks or uh, um, waves in a, in a pond. You know, they, they manipulate these things as well, so you can get the uh, ladder rungs. They call it the Steps of Allah or uh, Muhammad's ladder. And there, there are many, many different poetic terms to describe the patterns that form. But essentially, it's diamonds in jello. These carbides are very, very hard, but they're also very brittle. So they need a very ductile supporting network. So the fact that this blade is as springy as it is is, is very intriguing. Uh, I want to, to find out exactly why it is that way. Um, what made the steel special is that in its day, all the other steels were inferior to it, or so some of the legends say. I found some more research which states that in its day, it was considered a poor steel for many things, but superior for others. And it's very difficult to interpret some of these records. We're working through translations, and many of the people that are doing the translating don't necessarily understand metallurgy or how a sword works or how tools work, but they understand the language. And word ideologies change. It evolves over time. So it's very difficult to find out specifically what they're stating. And it might be that the person that wrote it originally in 12th century Persian uh, didn't understand what he was talking about. Generally, that's not the case. And we, we try to weed out the sources that are, that are poor. But what it comes down to is the lack of anything superior to this made it a good steel and the ability to produce it in large volumes. This was a cottage industry for many villages. They would make sometimes 50 of these ingots, like we videotaped earlier, uh, in a single sitting. Now, it would take in a whole process to produce these things and to forge the blades, but these ingots and the swords were traded all throughout uh, India, Persia, uh, with the spread of, of Islam, it followed. So, you know, they, you can find blades like this in Spain because of the Islamic influence. So it's, it's ubiquitous. These things are everywhere. The Crusaders ran up against these, and there were some fables about these Wootz blades cutting the Crusaders' swords in half. I, I want to believe that, but I don't. Uh, I think that's more popular myth. It's the same myth that says that the Japanese sword blades could cut a 50 caliber barrel in half. Steel is steel. It has limitations. But if properly used, it can be a quite incredible and dynamic material. But it isn't mythical. You know, it, it has its physical limits. And we're trying to find out what Woot's physical limits are. Bend tests like this under load have not been done before, at least it, in no records that I've found. Chemical analysis. Everyone's interested in, in what it's made out of but not so much its functionality. And it's important to know the constituent elements, but it's more important to know why those particular elements, why it became popular, why it worked. And no one's ever looked into that. Everyone wants to recreate it. Well, we can do that. You know, there are six people that I know of in the world that can make this stuff. And uh, I haven't had the opportunity to try their blades but I see limitations in the blades I'm manufacturing as opposed to modern steels. I think that Wootz was very superior in some respects to the other steels of the time, but it stopped being made for a reason, be that the lack of the raw material or lack of interest on the part of the, the ironmonger that was making it. There, there's a reason why it's stopped. Technologies evolve, and they get eclipsed, and you abandon those techniques. 
So Lutz was, for whatever reason, abandoned. It stopped being made. And we need to figure out not only why, but was there perhaps an eclipse of the technology? Were there other things out there that were better? Were there other things out there that were better at the time? Not just modern times, but back in the day. And it, it's very difficult to find out. Um, maybe impossible. I don't know. That's up to cultural anthropologists and other metallurgists. I'm just a blacksmith. So we're hoping that the results from this blade will tell us a lot. Um, at least it'll answer some questions that either haven't been asked before or no one thought important enough to answer. So, this is an M2 modern bimetal saw blade with rather coarse teeth. You have no idea how much this hurts. <laughs> it's not often I, I dissect other people's work like this. We're, we're about halfway through. It's offering very little resistance to the bandsaw blade, but this blade is designed to cut other steels. So that, that doesn't surprise me. But uh, well, we'll cut it the rest of the way through. There's a odd play of light right down the center of the blade that is probably more the action of the uh, bandsaw blade than anything in the steel itself. In order to be definite about any structures, you need to polish it to a high level, perhaps acid etch it to bring out certain structures, and definitely look at it under a microscope. There's only so much you can tell at the macro level, and the polish has to be very good. Um, right off, the cutting tool like this is not the best. But, you know, how often are you going to get a shot like that?